words of Monty Python, now for something completely different. I'm going to start off tonight by addressing the question that probably a lot of you, or many of you, had when you saw my talk, which was postmodern math. How does it make sense to think about a postmodern mathematics? Aren't the statements of mathematics supposed to be true and thus independent of nebulous philosophical trends like postmodernism? In a sense, this is obviously correct, but scientific and mathematical discoveries, no less than innovations in more explicitly cultural fields like painting, literature, and music, help to shape understandings of the world. Descartes and Newton's discoveries helped to forge scientific, cultural, and political modernity. But while the work of these philosophical and mathematical pioneers has been studied extensively in conjunction with contemporaneous cultural explorations, no comprehensive investigation of the links between postmodern art and mathematics has been undertaken, except unless it's being undertaken in conjunction with the National Mall, which I would love to hear more about later. Um, I'd like to sketch the, my beginnings of this investigation here with you all tonight. I propose that we take a cue from Heidegger, and we understand modernity to be, at its essence, the drive to analyze and systematize the world as a knowable totality that began during the scientific revolution. This drive towards perfectly systematic knowledge is reflected not simply in the great works of natural science, the classifications of Carl Linnaeus being a prime example, but in a, diver in a diverse array of undertakings, from the rigidly programmatic music of Johann Sebastian Bach to Frederick Taylor's plans for a utopian workplace based upon a perfect knowledge of human anatomy. But tonight, we are primarily concerned with how this drive for totalized order played itself out in the artistic and mathematical explorations of the 20th century. We unfortunately do not have adequate time to explore this topic in depth. I've been warned about a uh, shepherd's hook or a trap door from JD more than one occasion, um, but rather must constrain our discussion to a few selected case studies. In terms of mathematical modernism, the Principia Mathematica, authored by Russell and Whitehead, uh, for, and first published in, 19, in 1910, stands as a particularly compelling example. Russell was both inspired and troubled by the paradoxes he had discovered arising from the work of Gottlob Frege. Russell and Whitehead set out to dispel these paradoxes and put the discipline of mathematics on an irrefutably firm footing to remove any possible doubt concerning fundamental axioms. Russell sought to make mathematics airtight in a paradigmatically modern manner, entirely complete, totally ordered, and fully knowable. This selection of a proof illustrates the lengths to which Russell and Whitehead labored to dispel ambiguity, confusion, and assumption from their system. This demonstration, which is found on page 386, culminates in the conclusion that, quote, you can see this on the bottom, from this proposition, it will follow when arithmetic, arithmetical addition has been defined that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Don't ever take it for granted. The crux of Russell and Whitehead's system was its theory of types, which created an absolutely different kind of existence for sets and members of their sets. While it is re relatively straightforward to see how the set of prime numbers is of a different kind, uh, is a different kind of entity from a prime number, it becomes more difficult to see how members of the set, the set of sets that contain prime numbers, are different from the set that contains them. Nevertheless, Russell and Whitehead's system strove for a com total completeness and transparency of mathematics based upon a radical ontological separation of mathematical elements, such as prime numbers, and sets of these elements. They insisted on separating the discourse of numbers from its meta-discourses. In very different ways, many of the advanced artists of the early 20th century sought to pursue aims parallel to those of Russell and Whitehead. But rather than an unimpeachable mathematical logic, they sought to create a different kind of perfection. Artists such as Mondrian, Kandinsky, and Brancusi sought to make aesthetic form and vision an object of modern knowledge, rigid, rule-governed, and complete. Kandinsky, in particular, was adamant about the possibilities of such experimentation. As the self-proclaimed originator of totally abstract painting, Kandinsky believed that art could be systematically improved towards a global synthesis and the dawning of a new age. The difficulty lay in figuring out what to make. Kandinsky held that the slightest variation in aesthetic form could have dramatic repercussions in how the finished work was viewed, an effect he likened to the way in which the slightest breeze can radically alter the appearance of smoke. Nevertheless, the drive to systematize art needed to be undertaken if progress was to be made at all. He sought to organize aesthetic sensation in his program uh, for the Institute of Artistic Culture, and I quote from this for a minute. We know, for example, the powerful and invariable effect of different colors proven by experiment. Red in a color bath increases the activity of the heart 
which is in turn uh, expressed in turn by the acceleration of the pulse. Blue, however, can lead to partial paralysis. <laughs> While Kandinsky was particularly obsessed with color, it is the gridded form rather than the colored content of this work which truly reflected the modernist mission to know and map the world of art. In the realm of sculpture, this fascination with uh, geometric regularity of the right angle was taken to its zenith by David Smith. Smith's works encapsulate the, modern, the sensibility of modern sculpture. It was to be abstract so that it looked modern, but it was to be roughly anthropomorphic so that it was still recognizably sculpture. It was to be composed out of durable materials as sculpture traditionally had been, but preferably materials that were recognizably modern, such as Smith's galvanized steel. Like Kandinsky and Mondrian, Smith sought to achieve a perfection of form and viewer perception through the use of the ideal geometry of the cube. These decidedly modern artists strove to set art on as firm a footing as Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica. Barnett Newman, who's nearly, to impos nearly impossible to photograph Vere Heroicus Sublime, as you see on the screen, was another of the many modernist painters who relied heavily on pure geometry. But Newman is worth mentioning here briefly because of the way that he neatly summed up the modernist view of the relationship between art and a meta-activity, art criticism. For Newman, art was essentially a visual rather than verbal activity. He famously quipped that, quote, aesthetics is for the artist as ornithology is for the birds. For Newman, the artist simply exuded art the way that a bird flew. Language was the realm of the mere mortal who could try to describe flight but can never truly fly. As such, art criticism could be a kind of derivative activity, but language could never capture the truth of the original work. As in Russell's Principia Mathematica, discourses and metadiscourses must be kept rigidly separate. At different times and places, and for very different reasons, cracks began to appear in the comprehensive project of modernism to know and map the world in toto. Werner Heisenberg demonstrated that observational uncertainty was not simply a technical limit of instruments, but built into the very nature of observation. Behavioral economists worked to undo the picture of the individual as a self-interested and rational actor. Theorists of all stripes exposed the way that the modern project to diagram and organize the globe and its peoples was fraught with racist and sexist motivations. Postmodern insistence on incompleteness, unknowability, multivalence, and contingency seem to spring up independently in myriad times and places. It is nevertheless my hunch that there is a special parallelism to the mathematical and aesthetic responses to a modernism that seem to overreach itself. There is a sense of crumbled monumentality that these disparate responses seem to share, a recognition that the great constructions of previous masters have come apart at the seams. talk about two quick examples. Impressed with the formal rigor and the nearly inhuman level of completeness represented by Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica, mathematician Kurt Gödel utilized these characteristics to conclusively demonstrate that the modernist aspirations to completeness were doomed to failure, not simply from a practical, but from a logical point of view. Let us quickly introduce one of Gödel's most devastating critiques. While Russell and Whitehead had attempted to prevent self-referentiality in their system, what they had correctly perceived to be the downfall of Frege's earlier work, Gödel found a way to reintroduce a paradox that dates in altered form to pre-Socratic philosophy. The liar's paradox, which can be phrased as simply as this statement is false, is self-contradictory because its truth values are, are self-dependent. If the statement is false, it becomes true because the statement is accurate. But if the statement is true, it becomes false for the very same reason. Using an ingenious coding method, which we don't have time, unfortunately, to discuss in detail, Gödel translated this paradox into something more mathematically relevant. Using Russell and Whitehead's system, Gödel created a mathematical equivalent of the logical statement, this statement is unprovable, and demonstrated it to exist within the supposedly airtight world Russell and Whitehead had constructed. Gödel demonstrated that mathematics was necessarily incomplete. There would be propositions whose, tr whose truth value was permanently undecidable. This paradox, based on a notion of self-referentiality, was part of a larger demonstration that the notions of completeness and consistency are mutually exclusive. It was self-referentiality, a collapse of discourses and meta-discourses, that spelled the end of modernism. In a parallel manner, the sculpture of Richard Smith suggests a modernism that has come apart at the seams. 
a situation in, in which completeness and consistency are revealed as a mirage. In perhaps his most famous work, Smith reprises the modernist vocabulary of pure geometry, the cube of Smith, of Smith Mondrian, and Newman, but recasts it in terms of contingency, dingy materiality, and even menace. A similar work actually killed an art handler setting it up in a museum. Just as Gödel utilized the robustness of Russell's system in order to tear it down, Smith gives us the modernist dream of perfection, represented by the notion of an ideal cube collapsing under its own weight. But it's not simply in its refusal of pristine services and good form that Sarah enacts an almost Godelian dismantling of sculptural modernism. Just as Gödel used a notion of recursion to flatten the distinction that had supported Principia Mathematica, in his process works such as casting, Sarah explodes the hierarchical divisions between elements and meta-elements. In, in these process works, Sarah collapses the distinction between process, traditionally something like carving, or in this case, casting, and product, traditionally something like a human figure riding a horse. Here, the process is the product. But even more significantly, Sarah's work figures as part of a larger trajectory to embrace, embrace language within the domain of the visual, a tendency theorist Craig Owens has cited as the beginning of postmodernism. Sarah's process-oriented work actually began their lives as a linguistic, as a, sorry, began their lives as linguistic rather than sculptural forms in a list of action verbs Sarah had written down the year before as a work of art. This eruption of language within the field of the visual, as Owens described it, was particularly problematic because it erased the distinction between art and words. Artists were writing criticism while words were appearing in works of visual art, like in John Baldessari's fantastically recursive, This Is Not To Be Looked At, which is, all, which is most certainly a kind of visual liar's paradox. The hermetic purity of modernism be, uh, reflected in the outlook of Barnett Newman became hopelessly polluted. Modernism gave way to postmodernism. We have not even begun to scratch the surface in terms of elucidating the parallels between aesthetic and mathematical postmodernism. The rhymes are almost too many to count. Claude Shannon's insistence on the unquantifiable information that stands apart from its content prefigures Derrida's celebration of the liberation of the signifier from the tyranny of the signified. The discovery of fractals as capable of modeling stochastic systems was coincident with the rise of process art, like Sarah's cast lead works, which emphasized the sort of chaotic processes that fractals were first able to model. I could go on. But the point is not simply to note that these sorts of parallel, parallels exist, but to take them as evidence that a deeper threat is connecting otherwise unrelated investigation across time, time, place, and discipline. Scientific and artistic works do not simply reflect, but also produce the condition of their own making. Their makers respond in systematic ways to common stimuli and contemporary needs. Moreover, the creation of physical form and the discovery of mathematical truths have had an intertwined history since the Greek discovery of geometry. It is only recently, with the advent of modernism, that these pursuits were separated in the way that we commonly understand them. And like separated siblings, they seem to be continuing to mirror one another.